Happy Sabbath and welcome to the live stream worship service of the Walla Walla University Church. We are so glad that you are able to join us for worship this morning and we pray that the spoken word, worship and music and prayer will be a gift and blessing to you. Our broadcast ministry is run by over 50 volunteers and staff and they would love to hear from you. A note of affirmation and a note of encouragement would be more than welcome. Please feel free to send them an email address, which you can find on our website. If you would like to continue to support this service and ministry of this church financially as well, you're welcome to do that through our website. May this Sabbath and many moments with Jesus be a blessing and a gift to you. to worship this morning at the University Church. We are so glad you are all here. We have a number of visitors with us as well, and we're pleased that you have all joined us for this very special Sabbath morning. The psalmist says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. 
Our feet shall stand within thy gates to give thanks into the name of the Lord. And we come. It is God who invites us, and we come to give thanks for his blessings, for his presence as a refuge and strength in times of trouble, and to open to him the longings of our hearts. Let us stand and sing together the first hymn in our hymnal, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation.
Do you remember the text that says a little child shall lead them? The children knew what the sequence was going to be. Daryl had a little trouble. <laughs> Will you trust me to stand and sing together now? <laughs> Let's do that. Hymn number one. Lord God, we open ourselves to you. Turn our thoughts heavenward. Let us hear words and notes that draw us close to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
This morning, it's my privilege to be able to, on behalf of the pastoral staff and uh, the 10 months, Daryl, that you have spent here with us as our interim senior pastor, we would like to invite you to come up. You have operated again, coming out of retirement, a la Michael Jordan, uh, to impress on this congregation once again your love for God and your love for Christ and your love for this congregation. And you have worked from your heart and you have worked with a team that needed some guidance and some intervention and we appreciate your time here with us so thank you for the honor of serving with us uh, on behalf of the upper columbia conference we'd like to extend our gratitude as well for mentoring and being uh, of service through this transition and not only in this transition though but a life led in service that is an inspiration to us all. And so thank you for that, Daryl. Pastor, when we needed someone to step in, there was someone that the Lord chose to step in for this season as an interim. And we praise and thank the Lord for you. Amen, church? When we needed you, you stood and filled the gap. And so we celebrate your ministry today. We thank God for you and Barbara, and we pray God's richest blessings upon you. Thank you for stepping in when we needed you as a church family. Let's pray together and give thanks. Father in heaven, we give thanks for this soldier of the cross, this man that you selected long ago for ministry. When we needed him, he stepped up, and Lord, with grace and compassion, and with wisdom, he has led us these months. And so, Lord, we praise and thank you for his ministry. We thank you for Barbara. We thank you for his story. We thank you for his experience. And we celebrate our pastor here today, Pastor Darrell Bigger, for your glory with thanksgiving your church together. Gives thanks for you, Darrell. In Jesus' name, amen. We have some gifts for you. These are on behalf of the pastoral staff. We have cards as well from all of the congregation to say thank you for your time. And because you've been through the muck, um, we got you some muck boots. <laughs> and also because we expect you to continue riding, uh, you have a new cowboy hat for your... <laughs>
if you recognize that. <laughs> oh, are you going to take the hat, too? I leave with some degree of sadness, uh, but I'm glad I'm staying with all of you. Uh, we do, do love you. <clears throat> Speaking of replacements, there's a change in your bulletin. Uh, Jason Schaefer was to read the text today. His father is substituting for him. I told Curtis to do the best he could. <laughs> and a delightful part of this congregation and worship service time is a children's story. I used to say that every Sabbath morning, we all had opportunity to hear the message three times. In the children's story, in the text read for the day, and in the sermon itself. So, boys and girls, come forward now. Time for a story. You will receive some gifts on your way down the aisle that helps support children and family ministries here. Thank you very much.
Good morning, good morning. Can you guys hear me? Good morning. I'm so glad you're here. Good morning. Didn't my kindergarten friends do a great job? Weren't they fabulous? Thank you, kindergarten friends, for coming with me. I appreciate it. Okay, let's get down to business. Let's talk about sports, okay? So if you love sports, if you're good at sports, you like playing sports, it's super fun for you, thumbs up. If that's where you stand, thumbs up. Hey, if you do not like sports, you would much rather just be inside or read a book or play an instrument or do something else and it's not fun for you and you don't want to do it, thumbs down. Maybe a few people. Now there's another group, there's another group that's in the middle, and that is if you like sports, but it's really hard for you, and it's something that you have to practice at really hard and you work at really hard, but it doesn't really come naturally to you, thumbs to the side. Anybody there? Let me tell you, friends, I am in the thumbs to the side group. Can you name some sports? Somebody with a raised hand, tell me a sport. Sabrina? Soccer is a sport. Now, I love soccer, except for it's really hard to run, and then you have to get the ball into the net, and that is hard work, too. Um, let's see. Jacob, do you have a sport? Basketball. Oh, I love basketball, except for I can never actually get the ball into the net, and that's kind of a problem. Let's see. Emily. Croquet. Yeah, croquet is a fun sport. There again, you also have to have a little bit of... Um, you know, aim to get it into, into the wicket there. Okay, uh, last one, Hudson. Football. football. Oh, I love football. You know what? I love watching football <laughs> because football, <laughs> oh, man, that is some hard stuff. It's, like, really rough and tough and lots of sports. Go ahead and put your hands down. Um, can I tell you, sports not really my thing. I was more of the girl who kind of did the ballet and did the piano and did all that kind of thing. And, and that's what I like to do. Now, have I ever told you about my best friend? Let me tell you about my best friend. Her name was Lori. And Lori and I, this was in grade school. We were about probably third grade. Lori and I were very different. I have straight hair. Lori's hair was very curly. Um, Lori really liked doing math. Math wasn't my favorite thing. I liked reading and writing. Lori had two sisters. I had one brother. We were totally different. Can you guess how else we might have been different? What do you think, Brianna? <coughs> Lori was so good at sports. Lori was the kind of person that if you were playing a sport, you absolutely wanted her on your team. Now, back in the day when it was time for kickball, which is what we played like every single recess, we would have to pick teams. Now, we don't do it this way anymore because it sometimes hurts people's feelings. But we would line up a long line of kids, and then we would pick the two best kids at the sport to be the team captains. At my school, this was always Kevin and Ryan. They were the team captains. And so they would go up, and if you're picking a team, and it makes sense, you want to have the very best people on your team. And so they would start with one kid, and they would pick one kid, and we would all kind of stand there. And I would get kind of nervous because I didn't know if they were going to pick me or not. And my, my hands would get really sweaty, and I could feel my face maybe getting a little bit red. And I would stand there, and I would wait, and I would wait, and I would wait. And I never got picked. And do you know what the worst thing about not being picked is being the last pick? Is that you're not actually even picked. You're just kind of like the last person, and then they say, okay, well, you can have Holly. And so then I would go on to that other team. <laughs> so it was kind of like a stressful thing to me. Now, Lori, can you guess like what number Lori was picked? Like one or two or three or even five. But regardless, she was always picked near the beginning. And Lori was a good enough friend that she would watch me and she would kind of see my spirit kind of crumble a little bit. And she would see that I would get kind of sad. And so one day, something amazing happened. Something happened that changed my life. And that was this. It was time for kickball again. We all lined up. I was there standing. Do you think I was nervous? Absolutely. I was nervous. I was waiting. And the two team captains... Kevin and Ryan were picked, and they went up and they started picking, and Lori was probably the second or third pick, and do you know what she said? She said seven words that made me so happy, and they were, 
me and Holly come as a package. So what she meant was that if they wanted her on their team, which they did, then they got to have me too. And so I didn't have to stand there and be the very last person picked. Because do you know what? When you get picked very, very last, it makes it kind of hard to have fun and, have, and to play and to feel like you're part of the group and you're accepted. And my friends here who, for kindergarten who sang their song, I want you to think about two things. Number one, everybody is different and everybody has talents. They talked to us about the fuzzy wuzzy bear and his fuzzy wuzzy hair. And they talked about the butterfly having his wings and the crocodile with the great big smile. All of those animals had different things about them that made them special. I might not be the best at sports, but there's something different about me that makes me special. The other thing I want you to think about is... Do you have a friend like Lori? Do you have someone who has your back and who's going to back you up no matter what? Are you a friend like Lori was to me? I want you to think really hard about the friendships that you have and the friend that you can be so that you always have or can be a Lori who's going to say, I want to be with this person and I'm going to stand up for them. Thanks for listening, guys. You can go back to your seats. We have in our bulletin the Family of God section where church members can request prayer, and we want to bring to your attention several new requests. There have been several deaths in our extended family. Uh, Jim Libby, the brother of Laura Rutvik, died suddenly in a motorcycle accident while riding with friends in Baja, California. Uh, his sons, Justin and Landon, are both graduates of Walla Walla University, but the Libri and Rutvik families remember him as someone who enjoyed life fully and was doing just that at the time of his death. Kenneth Ladd, the husband of Jackie Ladd and the father of Lisa Como and Michael Ladd, died in Burlington, Vermont, after working in financial administration for the Seventh-day Adventist Church for over 40 years. And Pat Crabtree, mother of David Crabtree, died here on Friday, March 1, and they are planning a private memorial service sometime in April. So you're invited to write notes of comfort and encouragement to these and any others that you know of uh, by filling out one of the Connect cards in the pew in front of you uh, and just giving it to the uh, deacons or the offering basket Why uh, the pastoral staff will see that they get to the right people. And another special focus of our prayers this morning are for the placement dedication of our new pastor, Andreas Bakai. To facilitate that for us, we have several representatives from the Upper Columbia Conference. Those of you who are visiting with us may not be aware that Adventist churches are organized into geographical regions. And uh, these representatives from Spokane are administrators, coordinators of the Upper Columbia Conference, of which we are a part. We are very fortunate to have these gentlemen here this morning there are 128 other congregations meeting at this moment in time with whom they could be this Sabbath morning. 
We are very grateful for their willingness to devote this time and focused attention to us as a congregation and particularly to our new pastoral family. Minner Labrador, the conference president, will introduce his colleagues. Church, what a happy day. For many months you have been praying for the Lord to lead you to the person he had selected. And after many months of search, intercession, and excellent interviews and working hard through your search committee and the conference personnel committee, the Lord has led us to our senior pastor uh, that we will mention here in just a moment. I'd like to just introduce you to Brian Harris, who's our Vice President of Education at the Upper Columbia Conference. Next to him is Rodney Mills, who's our Vice President of Administration. And next to Rodney is our pastor's pastor, uh, Mark Weir, who's our Ministerial Director. And so at this time, um, Elder Mills would just mention a few words as we welcome our very special family today. You know, many months ago, the search committee here at our church began to look for a senior pastor, a lead pastor, and after praying and asking God's guidance, that process has come to an end. And today, the search committee, Doug Johnson, the Upper Columbia Conference, are proud and honored to introduce to you Pastor Andreas Bakai, his wife Cassandra, and little one Eden. We're so glad, we're so glad that you are here. Pastor Andreas comes to us from the Seattle area. And, you know, as we began a new chapter in the history of the Walla Walla University Church, as a new page is turned, we can only imagine what God is going to write in this new chapter. As we allow him to write his will in our lives, it'll be exciting to see what he is going to do through the leadership of Pastor Bakai. We'd like to invite the other pastors to come up and the elders of the church to come up and surround as we have a special prayer for Pastor Bakai and Elder Labrador will be leading in that prayer. As the pastors and elders come forward, we invite you to kneel as far as possible as we seek the Lord in this pastoral prayer and also placement prayer. Almighty God, everlasting Father, we approach your throne of grace in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, we praise you for being who you are, for your abounding mercy in having rescued every one of us. Father, thank you for your abounding grace. Lord, thank you for the blessed hope Lord, we do pray and intercede for the families that have lost a loved one. We pray for your comforting spirit to be with them. Lord, may the hope of your soon return burn bright in their hearts as they mourn the loss. 
Father, we also pray for those that are here that may be hurting physically, emotionally, or spiritually. We pray for your spirit to be with each one and for Jesus to remove all burdens that they may be carrying. Remind them of your love today, Lord. And Lord, as we transition into the placement of this pastoral family, we give you thanks, O Lord, for having spoken through the search committee, personnel, and conference committees, and especially for having spoken into the heart of Andreas and Cassandra. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to them and for speaking to this church family. And today, Lord, in this placement, as pastors and elders and members, we pray a special blessing upon them. May your spirit, O living God, fill this man as he leads and ministers in this congregation. Lord, may your blessing rest upon Cassandra as she ministers by his side. Lord, be with Eden as she grows on this campus and as she attends her classes and her schools. Father, may we as pastors and elders and members pray for his leadership and for his family. May we hold his hands as Moses had Aaron and her hold his hands. Lord, may your grace come through his preaching and his ministry. And Lord, when the days are hard and difficult and the nights are long, we pray that your comforting spirit would be with him and the family, that he would know that you have called him to this moment in time and to this pulpit. And so, Lord, we officially mark this Sabbath as his commencement as lead pastor of this congregation. Thank you for bringing him to us. Bless him. Bless the pastors that surround him and the elders. And may we all give you glory as we prepare for your soon return. And so, Lord, we conclude this season of prayer with the thoughts of John from Revelation as he closed his book. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen and amen. The scripture reading this morning is found in Song of Songs, chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. And I will be reading from The Message by Eugene Peterson. Song of Songs, chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. So where has this love of yours gone, fair one? Where on earth can he be? 
Can we help you look for him? Never mind. My lover is already on his way to his garden to browse among the flowers, touching the colors and forms. I am my lover's, and my lover is mine. He caresses the sweet-smelling flowers.
Jen. Before I begin, I want to extend my sincere gratitude to Elder uh, Mina Labrador and the team at the Upper Columbia Conference uh, for being part of the process to bring me here. I would also like to thank uh, Darold Bigger, who has been a voice of wisdom as I have transitioned into Walla Walla. And I'd like to thank the extended Walla Walla uh, family for being so gracious and kind to us uh, from helping us move in in record time to bringing us loaves of bread to helping us recycle cardboard to giving us tours of the town to giving us four or five maple counter gift cards <laughs> and for really letting us know that we are coming into a place that is excited for what God is doing and how we can be a part of that. I also want to say a special thank you to those who have come up to us and told us that you have been praying for us. There are prayer teams that I'm unaware of, and it feels uh, really calming and empowering to know there are people who I do not know who have been praying for months for our family and also for the transition here at the university church. And last but not least, I want to thank and acknowledge my uh, fantastic colleagues that I get to serve this church alongside. Uh, they are brilliant, they are funny, they are good uh, people that I'm looking forward to working with and serving this community with. And in fact, it wasn't the last thing, it was the penultimate thing. The last thing is to thank Rogers for singing and for bringing all of this music. Um, you know, I have one five-year-old and trying to get her out of the house, um, into the car just to go somewhere. If you're a parent, lots of parents are already laughing. It can take you 15 minutes. And so to be able to essentially herd like a hundred kids, get them to stand in the right place, to open their mouth, to make beautiful sounds, to sing, is nothing short of a miracle. So those teachers and music, and music teachers who made that happen, God bless you, we salute you, and we were enriched as a cause of your hard work. So again, thank you, we are so glad to be here, and we are looking forward to what God is going to use all of us to accomplish for the sake of his kingdom here in Walla Walla. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are grateful that you have called us one more time to come and to Listen to your word. Father, we ask that your word will be alive this morning, that it will dance before our eyes. Father, we pray that our hearts will be stilled to be able to receive the word you have for us. We pray that you will remove distractions from us. We pray that just for these next few moments, each of us will hear a word from heaven. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I have in my hand an $18 Home Depot gift card. It was given to me in June of 2017 by a colleague who I had been working with at a nonprofit that will remain unnamed. After working together for a year, sharing stories, this colleague decided to gift this $18 Home Depot card to me, I guess, as a token of appreciation. When I received it, I was grateful, but I was also surprised. $18. Knowing the financial circumstances of the individual who gave it to me, I knew that they could have at least stretched and being polite and giving 20. <laughs> and so for the first time in my entire life, and hopefully for the last, for those who have any smart ideas, this will be the last $18 gift card I am ever given. And this will never be spent. This card has become for me a token of scarcity and of constriction in how people navigate life and have relationships. 
Scarcity lives and lurks under the floorboards of the house which is built by fear. It's the mistaken belief that there simply is not enough to go around, that life is a zero-sum paradigm, and if I give you a slice of the pie, there will not be enough left for me. Scarcity means that it's difficult to recognize colleagues when they have done good work. It means it's difficult to share resources because we don't believe there is enough for all of us. Scarcity also impacts our most intimate of relationships. And scarcity can be seen in the child who doesn't want to share their sweets because they believe if they give you one of their Haribo that there will be none left for them. Scarcity is living in a home where every month there was more of the calendar left than your parents check and you lived wondering if you would have enough. And that became entrenched in your psyche and you became an adult in a home that rationed toilet paper. Or perhaps you went to the other extreme, you became an adult in a home that as soon as the paycheck hit, you would spend all of it because you did not know when the next check was going to come. And scarcity pushes us to live in ways and to have habits that do not make sense. Now, when I think about scarcity balcony, I think that often most of us would understand that scarcity probably is not something you want in your life. And so what we might do is build a wall around scarcity so that we can partition it from the rest of our life. But the thing with scarcity is that it seeps underneath the walls and it flows into the streams of our lives, affecting every part of how we live and how we navigate our everyday life. In fact, scarcity can affect the way in which we think about God. And so, instead of coming and regarding God as this benevolent, beneficent, generous God, we start to think about a God who is scarce in resources and in the ability to bless us. We start to think about a God who is miserly, tight-fisted, perhaps a divine bookkeeper who has been scammed one too many times by ungrateful people and therefore gives out his blessing only with suspicion. Scarcity. And today, we come to a song in the Bible which rebuts such a narrow picture of the God of heaven. The Song of Songs is about God. It's about human relationships. It's about the way in which we interact with each other. And this morning, we are continuing this winter sermon series through the Old Testament literature, wisdom literature, and it's called Wise Guys. And today, we are speaking about the Songs of Solomon, or the Songs of Songs. This book doesn't have much structure. It's a song of poems. And those who are English majors are thinking, yes, it's a poem, therefore it's free-flowing, it does not have structure. And the engineers are already starting to wriggle and think, wait, we're going to do something which has no structure, and it's going to free-flow. This is the book of the Song of Songs. The title is a Hebrew superlative in the same vein as King of Kings. Lord of Lords, Holy of Holies, it's telling you that this is the greatest song. In Britain, we would say this is the bee's knees. It's the best. And this song is supposed to be the best of what the Bible has to say about human sexuality and the way in which we engage it in our life. Now, I'll be honest, um, when I first read this book, or shall I say stumbled on this book, I was about nine years old. Um, most of the kids have left, but I'm sure we have some nine-year-olds who are in the congregation. If you're nine, just wave your hand for me. All my nine-year-olds, all right? I saw a couple at the back. So when I was nine, I stumbled on the book. Oh, and another one in this corner. When I was nine, I stumbled on this book on a Sabbath afternoon when my parents had come from church and they were engaging in lay activities. And really, parents, you should be happy 
if the worst your nine-year-old gets up to when you are sleeping is sneaking through the Bible. <laughs> and so, I remember opening this book, never had heard about the Song of Songs, and all of a sudden, I started to read it. A couple of lines in, I am giggling. I'm thinking, no way. Somebody forgot to take this book out. <laughs> there was an adult who missed their shift when they were putting the Bible together, and now this is here for good. And so you look behind, you look left and right. I mean, what are your parents really going to say? Stop reading the Bible, Andreas. But I look and I start to read from chapter 1 of Song of Songs. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. This entire section here, they, you're not even going to make it through the sermon. We haven't started. I don't, this is Roger's kids, huh? Okay. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is better than wine because of the fragrance of your good ointments. And so, of course, as a good nine-year-old Adventist, I was just shocked. I am reading the Bible, and the Bible is speaking about kissing and about wine. Whatever next. <laughs> and so I keep reading. Verse 10, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments your neck with strings of jewels. We will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. The unholy trinity of impure behavior. And I was shocked that this had been left in the Bible. And I wondered why would God, in his all-knowing, all-powerful ways leave this text here. So if you've been here for the last couple of weeks, you would know that a month ago, Pastor Chris did an excellent job expounding on the book of Song of Songs. So you may be thinking, well, we've already done this, Pastor Andreas. And you're right, some of this will be recapped. Pastor Chris did an excellent job, and I think Pastor Chris also did a very strategic move in making sure that the first sermon I preached here, after I have been dedicated is from the Song of Songs. I think this is probably the equivalent of pastoral hazing to say, ah, <laughs> so the new guy is here, right? Ah, <laughs> you're going to be the senior pastor. Okay, let's see how you do with this. So thank you, Chris, wherever you are. And it may be of no coincidence that Pastor Chris is leaving us to go to Redlands in a few months. And so we have here the book of Song of Songs coming and speaking to us. And as Pastor Chris told us, the modern church's lack of engagement with the Song of Songs means it has gone through functional decanonization. And all that means is that we've ignored it so much it may as well not exist because we don't touch it because we don't know what to do with it. Historically, when this book is read, some will read the book as an allegory. And you know what an allegory is? You, you will take a symbol and you will um, impute on it um, stories and you will make it fit your narrative. Others now, modern scholars have said, well, we need to read the Song of Songs literally. And so you read it with all of the sexual overtones and you say, this is how it ought to be read. And I've been told that I should have spoken with Pedrito because he teaches a class, someone said, watch out. He teaches a class that students apparently line up so that they can take this uh, credit on Song of Songs. And then there is, I think, another way in which this book can be read. And uh, Richard Davidson from the seminary at Andrews has said, um, he subscribes to a literal reading of it, but with an accent so that we read it not just literally, but also typologically, meaning that we understand that this was written as a commentary on the divine gift for sexuality, but ultimately points towards Christ as being the true one who gives us our desire and our satisfaction. And in his magnus opus, The Flame of Yahweh, he talks about this being part of redemptive history. And I think this is important 
because as the sermon goes on, you may start to feel a little uncomfortable, but I have it on good grounds from Richard Davidson. This is redemptive history. It's not uh, ancient erotic literature which was just left by the side. It's not a Tinder cache which was not you know, deleted and then found. It's not an agony aunt column. This is God speaking to us, all of us, about our sexuality as human beings. Okay, let's, let's go into the book. Ian Duggard basically says this book is about desire stirred, desire frustrated, desire satisfied, and then desire frustrated again. But above all, the Song of Songs is about desire right there. Thank you. What's your name? She's not going to tell me her name. <laughs> the book is about desire. And the main voice in this book is a woman called the Beloved. And this woman is in love with a shepherd. And we begin the book with this woman who is engaged to be married, bursting and bristling with desire and deep desire for the man that she loved. And this poem flows from the man to the woman to the man to the woman, speaking about how much they love each other. There is a scene in the field, there is a scene in the house, and it moves from symphonic movements as they re reiterate and they repeat how much they love and they care and they desire each other. And this aching desire that this couple has for each other is found in this continual seeking and finding that happens. So they, they find each other, then they lose each other. They seek each other, then they find each other. And this first poem is all about that. When you go to chapter 3, verse 1, it reads like this. This is the woman calling out. On my bed by night, I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. And then they find each other. And the Bible tells us they embrace, then the scene suddenly ends. Chapter 5, verse 6, the poet does not lead us into the next scene, but brings the curtains down. The woman speaks about being lovesick. And then she goes on and says, my soul failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. Separation, seeking, finding. Separation, seeking, finding. If you want to know what the book is about, that, in essence, is what happens in terms of the structure. Then there is this um, thing of the sheer delight of physical uh, attraction that the couple has. And again, as I'm putting together, there's this th entire third row is now smiling and saying, yes, the physical attraction, get to it. <laughs> and it's important because if we, live in a, if we live a life in which the way we learn about physical attraction, right, if the way in which we learn about how to navigate sexuality is from a posture that it's an alien feeling that has been given to us rather than a divine gift which comes from within us to be stewarded appropriately, we will come to this book with very different eyes. And so the couple pauses multiple times and they start to give these exuberant metaphors to, exp to, to um, speak about each other's physical experience, right? Things like, your hair is like goats, teeth like sheep, temples like pomegranates, neck like a tower. It obviously makes no sense to our context. And I think even for this writer, this is not speaking about physical attributes in a physical way, but rather in a qualitative way. It's not saying that you literally look like your teeth are like sheep. And Dr. Lawrence Turner, when he was here a few months ago, my countryman from England, spoke a little about how absurd it would be to take these metaphors literally. And so this spiraling repetition, this poetic device, heightens and focuses the love they have for each other. Now what we're going to do is spend the next couple of moments in chapter three, because this chapter poses a challenge to me, maybe it will pose a challenge to you, 
about how we construct love and desire, we find a woman in chapter 3 who has unambiguous sexual desire. And it's interesting, again, as a smaller side, that sometimes when the Bible is denigrated as a Bronze Age book, a book which is um, completely repudiates giving women voices that we find here, a woman who is given her own voice, a woman who is actually imbued as being the one who can not just be a passive recipient, but can be active in how she feels. And so this book tells us that she has unambiguous sexual desire, and she wants to bring her beloved, the shepherd, to her mom's house. Always gets me. Love my mother-in-law. But if my wife had said, hey, listen, we're going to live with my mother-in-law, that would have been a problem. But this woman says, I want to bring the one I love to my mother's house, not just my mother's house, but to the room and to the place where I was born. Why? I think there's a couple of reasons, and they're instructive. She wants to bring the one that she loves into the place where she was born, into the epicenter of her life, into a construct of family. If this book was just about sex, and this is where the book has this fine balance between not just, not just being erotic literature, but also being instructive, is that this woman, when she had opportunity to meet her, her shepherd, could have just gone in a field or gone behind the wall. But she says, no, I want to bring the love and the desire I have within the context and the framework of my home, of the epicenter of who I am. So when we come together, it is not just flesh, but it is soul and body. It is all I am. It is intimacy beyond what is offered in many cultures today. And so she brings him to the house. And in this dream, the woman longs for deep intimacy with the one that her soul loves. And a word on intimacy today, I think that many um, of us, if you have children, if you have been a youth pastor, if you have worked with kids, if you listen to the reports of the media, you are petrified about how the small tablet or the small phone that your child has in their pocket is a gateway to all sorts of things that even if you had begged, tried, and pleaded when you were younger, you could never have had access to. We live in an age in which sexual mores have gone absolutely insane in the name of sexual revolution and liberation. And yet, what we find is that the opposite is in fact happening in the lives of many Americans. In a 2013 Washington Post article, lawyer Paul Rample argued that marriage in America was not working. So this lawyer, says, hey, guys, marriage is not working. I have a new solution. And so Paul Rample says that instead of having wedlocks, we're going to have wed leases. If you're a lawyer, you may be saying, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You, more business. A wed lease would be Jane and John coming together and saying, hey, we know there's a high chance this may not work, so let's just have a five-year contract, maybe 10, and then when we come to the end of the lease, we will re-up if we feel like it's been working out. And so we now have a world in which wed leases are being given as an alternative because the concept of intimacy within relationship is being pushed to the side. And like I said, we have young adults who have more dizzying freedom to sexual material than at any point in history and are able to hook up freely, and yet sociologists tell us are struggling the most when it comes to intimacy, even to the point now where there are companies who use artificial intelligence to make robots that can be companions for you. Companions that can say, hey, good job. You know, companions that can say, hey, you look stressed. 
let's do something together. AI has now been employed because we have a lack of ability to appropriately engage the sexuality God has given to us. So rather than having Victorian sort of mores where we repudiate it, we frown upon it, it's now so ubiquitous that people don't know what to do with it. People don't know how to talk to each other. People don't know how to have chit-chat. And so they are now going and going to artificial robots as a way for companionship. And I think that when you do this and you separate intimacy from relationship and relationship from commitment, you go down a path which does not lead to the flourishing or to the good of humanity. And I think that the Bible is clear, Songs of Songs encourages it, and the philosopher Beyonce said it well when she said, if you want it, you should have put a ring on it. There are reasons that Song of Songs, even when she speaks about her desires, it's in the context of dreams, it's in the context of family, it's in the context of deep commitment. Serial relationships, casual hookups, friends with benefits, cheapen love and cause damage to both parties. Sexual intimacy is one of the most transcendent and mysterious experiences of life. And I think we would do well to teach our young people to say, hey, you used to see the girl and pull her hair and think she was icky. You all used to look the same. Now you're starting to look different, and you're starting to feel differently to each other. You sit next to each other in chemistry class, and you have sparks that fly when you are next to each other. And I don't know about you, but I think I had deficient instruction in how God feels about our sexual impulses and desires that it always would make me feel as if I was doing something wrong by virtue of those feelings which were natural to me. Now, of course, we are not talking about a libertine way of engaging with our sexuality, but if you hear nothing else today, especially those of you who are young, know that the, the sexual impulse and the desire that you have in your heart appropriately channeled and stewarded is a gift from God. It's not something you need to be ashamed of. It's not something you need to beat yourself up over. And you have an entire book that shows a God-given way in which to work through the feelings that you have. And so, I'm back to this $18 gift card, and I think that some of us have seen sexuality from God. Really, there's a bunch of conversations, the do's and the don'ts, the ins and the outs. And yet, God did not give sexuality as a curse, but as a delight. God did not create humanity, and then at the very end, dig through his divine pockets, look for some spare change, and then give you an $18 gift of sexuality and say, hey, here you go. <laughs> don't, don't talk about it too much, but you know, it's for you. <laughs> what God did do is he gave us a gift which was $100. It was full and complete to bring joy it was full and complete to represent a type, now we make the turn from the real to the typified, of the divine relationship which first began and was first seen in the garden. And I think this is why the Song of Solomon is replete with garden metaphors and literally takes place in gardens. To look at the unsullied relationship that Adam and Eve have, to then see how it can be expressed in reality and with joy in, in the present and to look at the future and to see Christ as that great consummation of all relationship. Christ is not the one giving us 18 bucks to try to scrounge with, but to give us $100 
and to give us a gift beyond all compare. And Richard Davidson, in the title of his book, says that this love which is typified in the Songs of Solomon, which is shown, is in fact a love which has essentially been taken from the very throne room of heaven and has been put into the heart of humanity. And it is, in fact, your sexuality, the very flame of Yahweh. Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord turn his face towards you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance and give you peace now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. After the service, we have our Following the conclusion of our service, we will have an elder to my left, to your right, Elder Lois Blackwater, who will be available for prayer or for any questions that you may have. It is our tradition here at this church to treat the postlude as a part of worship, and so we invite you to uh, meditate and to reflect as the piece is played, and if you'd like to, be, if you'd like to exit, you'll be ushered out at the end. Thank you. 